today. I'm really pleased we um, have Catherine Doyle with us, a partner at Saul Ewing, who um, has been a long time collaborator with Penn, working with um, some of our most prominent and innovative faculty on their commercialization and patenting needs. Um, she's an amazing resource for all of us, um, has lots of great stories to tell. And I want to hand it over to her because um, she, she'll be a great resource for all of you. Um, very simply, a patent application, a bit like a grant application, there's a bunch of different sections. And the disclosure is really all of the text, the figures, the tables that disclose the invention. And if you guys have been through this process where you have patent applications that have been drafted for your inventors, you'll see that it, they're pretty big and deep. And, and I do will say that when I first started in the job, we weren't filing things electronically back then because it was a while back. Um, but my first boss said to me, we jokingly, he said, we weigh these before they go in because if they don't have enough words, we haven't done the right job. So they're boring, they're repetitive, but they actually have some, some sort of logic to them. The whole disclosure of the big fat document is the tax figures tables, and then a lot of words that describe the invention somewhat repetitively so that at all times we're looking at sort of the alternatives that the invention could also be and not just the actual thing that you all have discovered that's in the experimental data. So we divide the disclosure up into the background of the invention, which is like the introduction of a manuscript, although we try to make it much shorter. And the background basically says, disease, bad, invention, good. And here's the state of the prior art that, that didn't solve the problem. Then you'll see figures, just like figure legends. And then you'll see what we call the description, which will have really two major components. One is a lot of words and definitions around all of the permutations and combinations of what we think the invention is. And then there's the experimental details, which is really the you know, materials, methods, results of the work that you all have done. Right at the bottom of the application is, is the most important part, which is the claims. And these are a precise recitation of the claimed invention. They're numbered paragraphs, and they only have one period. So it's a big, long sentence in one period. And that is sort of, if you draw a box around it, is what you believe is your invention. When this goes into the patent office, and I'm only gonna talk about US law, but a lot of the laws in other countries are very similar. An examiner who has a PhD in this art, generally somebody who's, you know, in, in a lot of the pen medicine case, you know, say well-versed in immunotherapy. Um, these examiners are not, uh, they're not, some of them are lawyers, some of them are not. Some of them get some very light training in what they're doing, and then they're supervised, and others have been there forever. Their job is to look and see whether the claims, that box of words that you've written at the bottom of the application, are in fact patentable. And they apply the statute, 37 USC. Certain provisions of the statute are applied to the claims to see if they're patentable. And the most common ones are, does it, is it useful? And is it non-natural? And non-natural is, is in the statute, they say new, but what it means is, is it found in nature? And then is it novel? Has somebody else found it already and published on it so it's known? Uh, and if so, by definition, your invention is no longer an invention because somebody else invented it. The one that we have the hardest time with in the biotech world is non-obviousness where is it a baby step from what went before and somebody would get there anyway? Or is it a leap? Or something where somebody got the wrong results and sent you down the wrong direction and you alone, the inventor, managed to go down the right direction. And then the ones that are a little harder for, for people to, to grasp are, the claims have to be enabled by that big fat document we filed. So they have to, 
teach how to make and use the actual full scope of the claim. And also, the claims have to satisfy the written description requirement, which becomes very important in the antibody world, which is the claims have, the, the specification has to write what the invention is, not just how to make and use it, but in fact what it is. Public disclosure becomes really important for you all, um, where if you publish before you file, especially greater than one year before you file, but in reality before you file at all, a scientific article, a thesis, which is available in a library or on a computer that can be searched, an abstract which describes the data in a poster or talk, the abstract of a grant that describes so much of another person of skill in the art would know how to use the invention, a public talk or poster, a funding or partnering pitch that's without, uh, not covered under confidentiality, and um, any other public use of the invention. All of those are called a public disclosure. And if that has happened before you file, then you end up not being novel or being obvious, depending upon what had been disclosed. So when you're in doubt about whether you should publish, uh, send in an abstract for a grant, you know, a grant where the abstract would be published, you're going to go speak uh, at a talk and others are going to read your, your presentation before the talk actually happens, a research article that you send into a journal, you want to talk with potential collaborators, go to PCI. The folks at PCI are there to help you navigate through what to say, when to publish. We never want you to not publish, but if your invention is something that we, we should be filing on, we really want to file before you publish. So nobody's ever going to tell you not to publish. What they're going to do is call me or some of the other good attorneys that work for Penn late at night and say, we have an emergency. We need to get something on file real quick because X or Y is going to publish. So when in doubt about any of that, I want you to go to your colleagues at PCI. That's what they're, it's part of their job. So just quickly timelines of filing. So you'll hear a lot of stuff about a provisional patent application. That's like a stake in the ground for you file here and before that time is, is fair game prior art against you, even your own disclosures with some caveats. And after that, the, the, whatever else is published by others can't be held against you or your own publications. So what we normally do for all our university clients and particularly Penn is if you have an invention that PCI has decided through their triage process, they should go forward with, they ask us to file a provisional patent application. We work with you. We do a lot of back and forth around what the data are and we help get that patent application on file in the patent office for you before any of those public disclosures I just talked about. One year after that date, the provisional application is in the sort of lingo we use, it's converted either into the PCT, as you see on the slide, or the US or both. The PCT is short for Patent Cooperation Treaty, and it's an international patent application that if you think of it is kind of like a hovercraft hovering around for another 18 months, okay? It is examined at a rudimentary level. You get a read on whether you're patentable, but it's, it's pretty rudimentary. And 30 months from the original provisional filing, that hovercraft kind of drops down into each of the individual countries that you're gonna be examined in. So you can drop down into the US if you didn't already go in, you can drop down into Europe, Canada, Australia, Japan, wherever. That's very expensive. And Penn and all the other universities I represent don't go into that national stage in any big way unless there's a licensee or underwriting those charges. Because we're talking, you know, potentially a couple of hundred thousand dollars. It's pretty big. Most of that is filing fees, by the way. It's not attorney fees. It's upfront taxes and all kinds of things that are levied against the application. So the provisionals filed, 
One year later, the PCT is filed. And in that interim, you can add new data into the PCT. And we might add a lot new words around, you know, more tweaks to the invention. 30 months later, we file in the national stage countries in say five or 10 of them. And you can potentially then have issued patents in multiple countries that all claim priority back to the provisional where, like I said, anything that was published prior to the filing date of the provisional is fair game and anything published after is not. So natural, non-natural, let's just go through that in a little bit of detail. A natural thing the courts have now said is a nucleic acid, which encodes say a protein that's important. It's a naturally occurring antibody that your body produces in a reaction to something that, that it produced it to. Um, obser observing natural processes. So putting something into the body and then seeing whether or not say a metabolite of it goes up or down. A simple observation of what the body is normally doing with that thing. Even though the thing you put into the body is non-natural, what the body does with it is considered natural. So those diagnostic tests relying on an observation or the presence or absence, <clears throat> those diagnostic tests are no longer patentable. The court case that said that is, is Prometheus v. Mayo, and that came out, I think, in uh, 2012. Right around that same time, the ACLU and Myriad went, went at it on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, and out of that came the holding that nucleic acids are not in and of themselves, just cut out of the, the length of nucleic acid they're normally attached to, they are no longer patentable. Now, if you modify that nucleic acid in some way, you modify the antibody, or you do some clever things around diagnostic tests, they might get you over this hump. But if you don't do anything, those are not patentable. Novelty, simple. If it's out there exactly as, it, as, it, as you've claimed it, then you're just not novel and that's usually fatal. Non-obviousness, these are things that are hard because the prior art has to suggest or motivate the inventor to come up with what they did for it to be obvious. If the prior art doesn't show any motivation or suggestion, you may not be obvious. The prior art has to suggest that you would be successful in doing what you were doing. If the prior art doesn't suggest that, then you shouldn't be obvious. Sometimes examiners will cobble together two or three scientific articles and say, if I look at all these, I find in the whole your invention in your claims. Well, if all of those elements are not there in those three uh, pieces of prior art, then we can argue that you're not obvious. Or if the examiner took your application and in hindsight, went back and said, I'll find how to cobble these together. That's what we call impermissible hindsight. We can often argue against that cobbling together and say, the examiner wouldn't have known how to do that without we showing him or her how to do it based upon our application. Biggest ways you get over obviousness are to show in the prior art before you filed that others tried and failed or that your results are so unexpected, so much better, satisfied a huge unmet need that nobody else had satisfied even though the problem was there forever. So those are ways we try to get around obviousness, but it becomes a fact-based argument where we work with you. And by the way, everybody in our team has a PhD and, and we, can, we, can, we, can get, we can understand at a high level what the science is, and then we layer that on with the law. But we need your help sometimes to help us really understand what the prior art is, because you're in the, you're, you, you live this every day and we're just looking at it now and trying to understand it. So we often will engage with you to develop the scientific arguments and then we'll layer the law on top of that and try to get around an obviousness rejection by an examiner that your claims are not patentable. Next slide. Enablement, we talked about this, it's a pretty, decent standard. You really have to teach how others how to make and use the invention. And where we get tripped up on this is that if your claims, and I'm going to get to the claims in a minute, are broader than what 
the document, the specification we call it, teaches, then the examiner might say, well, you have to narrow those claims down to what you really did teach. Um, so it's teaching others of ordinary skill in the art how to make and use the invention. And then the written descriptions on the next slide, Jessica. And there is a distinction here between enablement and written description because you must describe what it is to satisfy the written description requirement. And, and that usually means chemical structure, if it's a chemical compound, or sequence or other identifying features that say it has this here, that there, and that there. And it can't, with no exceptions now, really be defined by function. You have to talk about what it is, not what it does. Typical patent application, this is an immunotherapy uh, application by Brenchens. They look like this. This is actually an issued patent. And if you look at the claims, which are at the end of the, the issued patent, here it's an immunoresponsive cell comprising a chimeric antigen receptor that binds to ROR1 and comprises an intracellular signaling domain of a CD3 zeta polypeptide and an intracellular signaling domain of a co-stimulatory receptor and B, a nucleic acid encoding or a recombinant CD40 ligand. Lots of words. But if you look at those words, you'll see that it's a car, binds to ROR1, has an intracellular signaling domain, but doesn't define exactly what that is. CD3 zeta, of course, is defined and has another intracellular signaling domain of a co-stimulatory receptor, again, not defined in the claim. And then it has a nucleic acid encoding of a recombinant CD40 ligand. So this is a pretty broad claim. The dependent claims from that, if you, if you look down through this, the, the claims, they all depend, most of them depend back up to claim one, from claim one. So in claim two, it defines the nucleic acid as, as a vector, a viral vector, a retroviral vector down in claim four. And then it starts to talk about the uh, immunoresponsive cells and defining uh, those. Then the cell is a T cell in claim six. And you see that you're getting this sort of cone where the claims are more and more narrow because each of the dependent claims is everything in the independent claim plus a little bit more. The trick here is if there's more words in the claim, the more narrow it is. So if you said, for example, claim, well, let me go to the next slide because I think it's easier to show. Very simple claim. Nobody's ever invented a chair has seat, a back attached to one end to the seat portion and legs that support this seat portion. Claim two, we say the chair, the chair of claim one comprising four legs. So two is a four-legged chair because everything in one plus what's in two. The examiner has determined that the chair having no definition on legs is unpatentable because it's too broad and, and it covers a bench or uh, whatever. So if you amend the claim where you delete claim two, you cancel claim two, and you take the word four and put it into claim one, now claim one is a chair, which is a four-legged chair. It can't be a three-legged or a five-legged or a bench with one big long leg. It has to have four legs. So when you write the claims, you write them as broad as you can. We do. And then we write dependent claims to more and more specific features, which if we have to, we lift back into the, depend the independent claim to try to show the examiner that we're willing to negotiate with them on something that's a little less broad, but not so broad that it would be sort of silly to patent it. So in claim one here, the chair is not defined as having leather, wood, steel, metal, whatever. That's in claim three, and we didn't move claim three into claim one. So the chair of claim one, anybody using a wooden, metal, plastic chair would still be covered by that claim, and we could ask them for a license. Okay? When the court looks at the claims, and when the USPTO looks at the claims, they look at its broadest reasonable interpretation. So they look at the plain meaning of the words that you wrote. You can be your own lexicographer. You can't really say black is white, that's a bit too far, but you can say an antibody is defined as anything except a single chain, or you can say an antibody is everything except 
a, a natural antibody. You can say that in the document, and now when you use the word antibody in the claim, it has to have the meaning you said it had. Other claims and the whole body of the document as a whole contributes to how the patent office interprets those claims. And what you've said they are or they're not in the prosecution history also contributes to what those claims are. If you have to, you can go to dictionary definitions if the claims are contested, or you can also look at what um, people would accept it to mean in the art. Um, if, if there's any doubt about how precise these words need to be, I, I, I'd love to hear from you because the examiner looks at claims and then looks at the body of the document to see if the claims satisfy all of the, the, the features of the statute. In a contest uh, litigation, the infringer looks at the claims and the courts look at the claims. And whether they should be valid in terms of the prior art, the patent office looks to see whether they should issue. And if they did issue, the court looks to see whether the patent office did their job right, always with respect to the claims. So they become the most important piece of the patent application. And actually, I have to tell you, I can write patent applications with music playing, you know, just plowing through it. But when I did the claims, I needed it to be quiet. No long blower people, no dogs barking, because they're really, you have to be very precise with them. They have to be non-natural, novel, non-obvious, satisfy written description and enablement. The complicating piece here is that up until not very long ago, antibodies were often defined not by what they were, but by the binding partner, by the antigen. And the law said it was okay to define an antibody by the thing it bound to. So it was the one molecule that you could define by function rather than by what it is. You all know this, there's tons of different kinds of antibodies that are non-natural, okay? There's, there's one or two here that are natural, but the rest are all non-natural. So monoclonal antibodies can be characterized if, if you make them by the hybridomas that make them, deposits required at the time of filing, by the amino acid sequences in the antibodies, particularly the CDRs, and any specific modifications you might have made of them, chimeric versus humanized, for example. And if you define them by sequence, they're easy to claim. You know, it's an antibody having this sequence. It's easy to prosecute. But if you just define them by sequence, it's very easy for the com competition to make a very similar antibody that isn't that sequence. Still binds to the antigen you want it to bind to, but isn't that sequence. So what do we do about that? And how do we satisfy the law while we get broad claims to antibodies? There's this old law that said that if the antibody uh, bound to a newly characterized antigen, as long as the newly characterized antigen was itself new, you would get a claim to the antibody. And that was a case called Noel v. Letterman. And then you could either disclose to get broader claims than just your antibody, you could disclose a representative number of those antibodies. Recently in Amgen v. Sanofi, in a dispute over the PCSK9 antibodies, here they had a claim which is in that one, two, three, fourth bullet down, an isolated monoclonal antibody where when bound to PSK9, it binds to at least one of the following residues on PSK9, P PCSK9. So the monoclonal antibody was being defined by what it bound to, not by what it was. PCSK9 was already a known antigen and the court came back and said, the written description requirement must be met by disclosing sufficient possession of the antibody species. And Amgen's claims were not valid because they didn't disclose what the antibody was. Instead, they only disclosed what it bound to. And they didn't describe enough of the antibodies themselves so that the, the uh, antibodies were not themselves patentable. 
And that new law then said that antibodies have to be defined based on structure, not function. And they have to be defined by specific antibody sequences. So how do we get you broad claims to antibodies under this kind of law? Because you'll have maybe figured out, you, you pan a library, you pull out a whole bunch of antibodies, say, and you know uh, the sequence of three or four of them. And what we do in the claims is we'll now write a claim to an antibody that has the sequence of SeqID1, which might be the sequence you found, or anything that is, and we'll start at say 90% identical, 91%, 92%, 93%, provided those antibodies have the same biological function as SeqID1. And that's how we try to get you some breath around those claims. Um, the other way is to claim them by way of the sequence of the CDRs, where you'll say an antibody where at least the first CDR has this sequence, the other two can have anything you like. Or the second CDR sequence, CDR2, and the other two can have anything you like, or the third. So there's ways of trying to get some wobble room around scope of claim for antibodies, even if you have to define it by sequence. The way the court reasoned that, that this should be the case anymore is that it is so easy now to sequence what you find in terms of antibodies. And, and even though you've got so much variation around the variable region, you can still sequence those because everybody can do that. That was their point. The technology had advanced far enough that the old law was no longer applicable. They should have disclosed the sequence of the monoclonal antibody, and he's exactly right, particularly the sequences of the CDRs. At the time they filed, they didn't have those sequences, and, and therefore they were invalidated. So antibodies by sequence, protected an antibodies are more open to competitors to design around, and we try to get around that by looking at homology identity, changing them around, and, and showing that we we, have, we can disclose a couple of sequences and then we say we're entitled to all sequences that would have those kinds of identity levels. One-on-one, new and useful. This is, this is important now to the, getting to uh, the biomarkers. So new and useful process, machine, manufacture, composition of matter, an improvement, or anything under the sun made by man. In other words, not made, made in nature. So laws of nature are unpatentable products of nature now, including DNA, are unpatentable, as are mathematical algorithms. Patentable, non-eligible, law of nature, diagnostics, detecting the presence of a component in a sample obtained from a patient, correlating it without more. Not patent eligible anymore. So this is not an eligible patent claim. Method of determining whether or not a human patient has rheumatoid arthritis comprising Detecting the level of an RNA uh, a rheumatoid arthritis marker in a sample, comparing it to a control wherein the detected marker level is at least twofold greater than the control level. That is no longer patentable under Prometheus because it's an observation of something that's happening in the body. Now let's look at the, the question that was asked. Can we patent the ratio of each biomarker to the others on the panel as compared to baseline. So the suggestion is a panel of secreted biomarkers in the bloodstream. Could we use that as a diagnostic to say, you're about to reject the transplanted organ, for example. So people could monitor this at home with a, with a good little device and then report back to their medical team. And that would apply for any person who has gotten a transplant organ. Now the question is, we have a panel of eight biomarkers. The question is, these are natural proteins, as you just said, that are theoretically unpatentable, but is there any way we could salvage this um, technology by perhaps looking at the ratio of one biomarker to the other as compared to controls or baseline levels? Is, this, is there anything there to salvage? So if you're looking at the ratio, you're still just observing what's happening naturally in the body, right? And it's being compared to the baseline. So if somebody has 
A and B ratios A, B, and that means they're going to reject. Mm -hmm. And somebody has B, A, and they're not going to reject. Mm -hmm. It's still just an observation of what's happening naturally in the body. Okay. What about the selection of these particular eight biomarkers out of the thousands of proteins that are being secreted? Is that patentable or it's just like the DNA? It's just that that still would be what, what the court is asking you all to do is to have some man involved consequence to the observation. So if we look at the next slide, and this is a very simple one wherein the patient is administered an anti-RA treatment when you have detected and seen and compared. So in your case, if your claim was looking at these ratios and when they're upside down, the, there's, the patient is treated for rejection. So you'd administer whatever you were going to administer to them. Now that's a non-natural event because there's a, a sort of a man-induced consequence to that reading. Okay. And that's, that's how we're trying to get around it. There's an odd thing going on in the patent office right now where the, um, bio the, the, the diagnostic industry has been devastated by the, the Prometheus holding. And the current director of the patent office, um, Dr. Iancu, who actually was at Penn last year and had the pleasure of having a long chat with him. Um, he's pushing very hard to have his examiners allow claims that go right up to the brink of what the court says, because he wants those to go up and be litigated and the court to come down with something softer. Because if you find new biomarkers in a person that really are key to somebody rejecting a transplant, Surely that's a good invention, right? And a highly useful invention and something how you can teach how to make and use. Mm -hmm. And actually you can show the written description for, and it isn't obvious because it's completely new. Well, what the heck, right? You should be able to get a patent for it. So, so can I weigh in? This is torque the claim so that there's, there's a step in there that's a tangible step according to the court mm -hmm. that's man done. Yes, Yos. I, I, I mean, we've done something similar with biomarkers, as you know, and I think it's maybe not so much about the proteins that you measure, but the algorithm, uh, the decision tree, I guess, that's really the, the, the key of the, the, the core of the, uh, the patent. And so that's, that's exactly what right is, because in that decision tree, yeah. man is interjecting. Yeah. It's not just I sat and I looked and I saw, right. it's then I did. So that's patentable. That is patentable. Yeah. That's the same thing. It's that right. I sat, I looked, I saw, and then yeah. there was a, a sort of a man, a man, woman <laughs> consequence yeah. that was performed, a step that right. was performed. Okay. Cell culture media for a specific cell type growth patentable. Um, a very similar factors, just in different com concentrations. So, the answer to that is yes. If you have a cell culture media that is very specific and it works really well, yes, you can patent it. But it kind of goes into this bucket of, you can, kind of, you can patent anything as long as it's novel and, and satisfies this non-natural feature. But if it's really narrow, so it's very specific components, so it's a cell culture media that has X amount of A, Y amount of B, and so forth. So there's five constituents and you're, you're listing them in very specific concentrations. Very easy for the infringer to come around and just add one more and now avoid your claim. So it is less of a question of whether it's patentable, more of a question of whether it's in fact commercial, commercially viable. And that's the kind of stuff, unless it sort of really causes the sales to behave somehow beautifully different, that you might wanna keep as sort of know-how and, and just not, you know, that, that would be something the lab would use, but not put it out there in a patent application. Because let's say you have just, you know, so much of this one ingredient and somebody decides that all you need to do is just sort of chop off the top of my finger and you're still good to go. 
it still works well enough. So it, that's, that's where PCI would help you figure out whether or not it's worthwhile patenting that, although it might be patentable. Patent application has to name the correct inventors. It's a legal determination, not a moral decision. The ownership resides solely with the named inventors unless those inventors assign the invention to another party. So for almost all universities, they will say under their patent policy that if you invent while you are employed by them in the area that you're employed to research, you hereby assign your inventions to the university and, and everybody does. And so if you're the inventor and you assign to the university, Penn is the owner, you're the inventor and under the patent policy, there's certain remuneration back to the inventors should that become commercial. And almost every university in the land now has that system in place. What if there's a collaborator that you're working with who belongs to Biogen and they might co-invent with you? Well, that Biogen person's gonna have to assign to Biogen and now the University of Pennsylvania and Biogen are gonna be the co-owners. And that means a lot in terms of who's gonna commercialize, the licensing rights, the, the actual sort of whole development of the, the technology. Or what if it's another university? So the whole point here is that the inventors have to be correct, um, but each co-inventor or each co-assignee when they assign to their employers owns an undivided interest in the whole. So in the Biogen example, Biogen can run off and do what they like with it because they own an undivided interest in the whole. Penn can license to a competitor of Biogen and now you have two people competing out there in the market. That's fine. It has to be correct. Joint inventions who contributed to the invention of even just one claim in the application have an undivided interest in the whole. And that's what the important piece is. Conception of the invention. Conception is the idea, a definite permanent idea of a complete and operative invention. It's almost easier to say who's not an inventor versus who is, because who's not an inventor are people just doing the work under your direction, didn't have the intellectual ideas, actually just ran the experiments. Joint inventors, really important. Don't have to physically work together at the same time or at the same time. Don't have to make equal contributions. Don't have to contribute to the subject matter of every single claim, just one claim but there must be a collaboration between the joint inventors for them to be joint inventors. Otherwise, what they've done is they've just invented simultaneously together. New law. This is the case that was, was decided uh, just this uh, July. This is a very long tortured history and I'm not gonna go into it in great detail with you, but if you're interested, I'll send you the case because it's got a lot of, um, it's a big long story. But the long and the short of it is, is that Dana-Farber was left off a patent that Ono Pharmaceuticals, the ultimate owner of a patent was uh, filed. And it had to do with uh, PD-1, PD-1 ligands and um, checkpoint inhibitors. So it was like a big deal, okay? So it went up to the federal circuit. There was a, a lawsuit Dana-Farber filed to have the Dana-Farber inventor added, uh, Dr. Freeman, and actually uh, Genetics Institute inventor, Dr. Wood, also ended up being added. One of the things it turned on was that part of the, cons they all had been collaborating, so that element of the law was satisfied, but they had published a little piece of the invention before the application was filed. And this was really weird because we had always said in the law that the invention by definition would be an invention that no one else knew about that it hadn't been published before we filed. But here, there was a paper that was published before the invention was filed. The claims were drafted to avoid that piece of prior art. The claims were found to be patentable and Ono argued that because these inventors had published a piece of it before the application was filed, they weren't entitled to be inventors. And what the court said was, but they conceived of the invention back before the publication. 
And because they conceived of it, that intellectual idea of what the invention is, they were entitled still to be inventors. So what it did was it took sort of this timeline that we look at around who the inventors are and who they're not. It managed to string it back in time, bumping over a publication by the inventors. And they still said those inventors were inventors. So that we're still all trying to process that. It doesn't change a whole lot because we still look at who conceived of the invention, but now we're being told by the court that if a part of that invention, which the claims were issued despite it, was published, it's still okay to say those inventors were inventors. So I know for some of you, Yos, for sure, I've been on the phone with a lot of you around who are the inventors of this application. And we ask you to tell us the story of how the invention began, who you talked to, who you collaborated with, do you have notes? And now we're gonna to have to be even more careful around not setting the timeline of when we discuss this, when, when we decide you're an inventor post publication. We're gonna to have to look back to the whole story, even if you manage to publish a little of it. And that's kind of the bottom line on, the, on that uh, piece. And uh, I just found that really interesting. And I think you guys should know that when we're asking you what your contribution to an application was, we're looking for when did you have the idea? When did you know what you had that would be a real invention? And if you did publish even a little of it prior to, we're still, we're still gonna take that, we're not gonna take that into account the way we might have before. So Yo says we try to avoid post publication filings. You're absolutely right, Yos. But filing versus when the invention began, I mean, as you all know, inventions can have start, you know, two, three years before you might file, before you're, it's sort of mature enough to file. And if in that time, a little piece of the invention gets published, you might still be okay. You could still be an inventor, provided it issues despite the publication. Then you have to have very careful documentation that the process started at a certain point Oh, yes, Yos. We always mm -hmm. ask you <laughs> for yeah. documentation. We, you guys go to these meetings. It's great. You yeah. brainstorm. I really need you, and Penn really needs you to memorialize those meetings as quickly as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, handwriting notes, you know, it's old fashioned, but it's often a really good thing. Right. Um, yeah. You may have noticed when, when, uh, when you're dealing with investors, they always come in with a lovely little rather small, looks like a reporter's notebook, it's often hardbound. And they open it up and they write in tiny little words. Mm -hmm. And they're memorializing the meeting and you guys should be doing that as much as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there's really good evidence of when you thought of it and not the other guy. And if you captured it electronically, say in Google Docs, is that valid? Because there's no timestamp. Well, email it. Once you write it, email okay. it to yourself. Okay. And that timestamps it. That's, mm -hmm. that's what we, there is software to timestamp a lot of stuff as well, mm -hmm. electronic notebooks, but if you email it to someone else, you will have a timestamp on it. 